Hello and welcome, and I don't think I've ever started a live stream exactly on the dot, but I have today, so that's good. Um, this is going to be explain and describe questions from the AQA, GCSE topics, EA, EM, which is electromagnetism, and the space topic as well. So I hope it's going to be really interesting and useful for you, but I know it's going to be really useful for you. Slightly later than advertised, this is uh, 8 o'clock, and it was originally going to be 9.30. First of all, before I just go into the content, I just want to remind you of the other live streams that I've done. This is going to be the sixth of um, six live streams that I've done. And I did some paper one content live streams ready for the first mock exam series. And this is all about paper two. So this is going through describe and explain ones today. The previous one was about uh, practice calculations. That was the one I did last week. And that was also um, paper two topics, forces and motion. And then previously I talked about how to actually learn from exam papers that you've already done. And that's a really crucial skill. Hello to um, folks in the chat already. Lovely to um, see you there. And if you have any questions at any point during this whole thing, there will be time for Q&A towards the end. Stick them in the chat. Sometimes I see them as I go and sometimes I see them um, right at the end. But um, I will review the chat uh, at certain periods. I will also say if you're watching this um, uh, recorded, which a lot of people do watch these after the fact and watch them recorded, which is great, it's useful content regardless of where it is, then do leave a comment if you have any questions in the comments box and I tend to get back to them. Or at the very least, they become ideas for future videos. So what's going to happen as we go through is you'll see this type of question. And I often talk through decode, plan, answer and check as being the kind of step-by-step -step way that you should learn to tackle questions so it's a useful thing to have that idea of actually tackling all questions in this step-by-step -step fashion and it allows you to really work out exactly what the questions is asking you hello to um i've got max i've got a vlad studio I've got a maximilian as well okay lovely to see you all all right um and the questions are going to get harder as we go through this uh, live feed is sponsored by Tassimai, so massive thanks to them. Tassimai is a quizzing app that you can use on your phone, which is based on the best evidence of how students learn. And I talk a lot about the evidence and research-based, um, evidence-based uh, revision techniques, and it's well worth actually using those. Uh, feel free to ask questions about Tassimai at the end if you like. It, it's used in schools and it's used in private subscribers. It uses three of the top five revision techniques, and it's based on an AI algorithm which selects the right questions for you at the right time. And then make sure you're doing practice quizzing, space revision, and interleaving your topics, and that's three of the top five revision techniques. And all you have to do is make sure you get your daily goals four times a week, and you'll make sure you memorize all of the key things for your exams. Okay, what's more, it's gonna help you target those other areas because you will get to know your strengths and your weaknesses. Okay, so straight in with the magnetism stuff then. Uh, first of all, this is an example of a bar magnet, and this is the field lines around a bar magnet. Magnets have north and south poles, and the magnetic field is strongest there, and that's shown by the fact that the lines are closest together at the poles. So the field lines, they actually describe the shape of the magnetic field. Okay, they actually describe the shape of the magnetic field, and the arrows always point from north to south. And that will allow you to explain actually magnetic behaviors, okay? And this is an idea of a permanent magnet. A bar magnet is a permanent magnet, okay? It means it's always gonna be a magnet. And um, all this is actually the idea of force fields, okay? So within those lines, that's a region where another magnetic material or a magnet can actually feel a force. Now, when two magnets are brought close together, they're gonna exert a force on one another. And that can either be attractive if it's opposites, and it can be repulsive if it's uh, likes so south and south here this is a um, field which is causing a repulsion whenever you're asked to explain why uh, a magnetic force arises then it's a good idea to talk about fields overlapping so essentially when the two permanent bar magnets come together their fields overlap and they interact so they have a force like poles attract uh, like sorry like poles repel and unlike poles opposites attract and uh, there's one more thing in this that's important to remember. When a magnetic material, which isn't a magnet at that point, is placed in a magnetic field, it can become a magnet. And we call that induced magnetism, okay? Like a temporary magnet, if you like. So here's an example question from this. Explain, this is our decode step. Explain why two permanent magnets move apart when their south poles are brought near to each other. <coughs> uh, brought near to each other. So the, the idea in your answer, um, you need to be thinking about those magnetic fields and you need to, need to be thinking about, well, what, what haven't they told me? They, they've told me they move apart. Okay, they haven't said they repulse. Okay, so perhaps there's going to be an answer. That part of our answer is that. Now we start writing our answer. 
Um, they both have magnetic fields as their explanation, and the magnetic fields overlap. Now, importantly, because they're in the same direction, because they have the same direction, they you get a repulsion. Okay, they are like poles. They're the same poles, so a repulsive force. Okay, they repel is another way of saying the same thing. Okay, so first question, first mark for getting the magnetic fields, second mark for getting the repel. Now, not only can permanent magnets be magnetic and induced magnets be magnetic, but also you get a magnetic field around a current, okay? And these are pictures, the red lines representing this first one. Let's talk about this first bit first. They represent current carrying wires and the current is going up the page in this case, okay? This is the current going up the page um, in this wire, and we, we can work out the direction of the field lines around that. Now, currents have circular fields, okay? So we draw them with these sort of concentric circles centered on the wire, centered on the current. But what direction is that? That's what you can work out with what we call the right-hand grip rule. So for this bit, you will need your right hand. My calculator on the road, so we'll do that today. <laughs> And uh, you can hold your right hand like a thumbs up sign, okay, or like you're gripping the wire. And the thumb would be the direction of the um, current. Your fingers point in the direction of the field. So you can see the tips of my fingers are the direction of the arrow. So for this first one, then that is this way around. So you can see just the arrow is drawn on there. Okay, the, arrow, the field is, the fingers are pointing this way around. And then if I reverse that, if the current is going down in the direction of the thumb, then the fingers are pointing the other way around, the opposite way around. So the field lines would be this way around. Okay, that is how you predict the direction of a field around a current carrying wire. It's called the right hand grip rule. Thumb for the current, fingers for the direction of the field. Now also we can show directions of current, not just up and down the page, but we can also show them going in and out the page. Now this cross means current into the page. And this dot means current out. And how to think about that, it's like, imagine like an arrow, you're throwing an arrow away from you, you can see the back of the arrow, you see the cross. If the arrow is coming towards you, you'd see the dot of the arrow, okay? So this is current coming out of the page. So again, we can use our right hand grip rule. The first one on the left is actually the current going down into the page. So I could draw the field lines like this. And the fingers just tell me the direction of them. This way. And I probably want to draw about three each time. Okay, put it on there. <laughs> and then for the other one, the current out of the page Again, this time it's coming up towards my camera here, um, out of the page, towards you if you like, and the field lines are going the opposite way around. And you don't have to draw it neatly with a compass when you do this. Out of the page, this way around. Okay, I hope that helps. It's a really kind of simple, could be two marks though to actually do that type of question. And here's an example of applying that. It's a bit harder now, okay. So a student has two parallel wires next to each other and they pass a current through in the same direction. Deduce and explain, deduce and explain what they would expect to see. So if we just actually think about it, you don't need to draw the diagram um, to actually answer that, but let's imagine two fields coming up at us out of the page, two lines, sorry, two currents coming up at us out of the page. Let's have a little look. They both have magnetic fields around them, okay? And they would both be in this direction. And what's actually the direction of the fields here? Well, this field is going up here, and this side, this field is coming down here. So those two fields in the middle there, in the space in between those two wires, are actually opposite directions. So what actually happens to the two wires is that they would actually attract. So deduce the first point, sorry that keeps flicking forward, doesn't it? Deduce the, the first point here is actually that they would, the wires would attract. Okay. 
explain and that is because their fields are in opposite directions in between. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. That's a tricky one then because you've actually had to figure that out and you had to apply that right hand grip rule. But yeah, show me a thumbs up in the chat if you get that one. Okay, so now we can actually put that idea together into what's called like a solenoid. And a solenoid is a loop of wire and I've drawn it here um, on the left hand side here. Okay, this is a loop of wire with a current passing through it and the current is like the looping round, round, round like a spiral shape, like a coil. But if we can imagine cutting through that, imagine like cutting through all those loops, we've got a plane that runs horizontally through them. So now we're the plane of this board here that's in this drawing. Now let's do this exact same thing with our uh, right hand grip rule and work out the directions of all those fields. On the left, it's current going into the page. So the field lines, and I'm just gonna draw one on it this time. It's really annoying that it keeps doing that. Um, they're all going this way around on the inside. Okay, and on the outside, they're pointing up the way. And on the um, right hand side of this drawing, then actually it's current up out of the page. So this is fingers in this way. So there we are. And just add all those in. So what's gonna happen to all those little fields in those, um, those wires? Well, actually, they're going to link together. Those fields are actually gonna all link together to make one larger and stronger field. So you're going to end up with, I'll just use a different color for this. You're gonna end up with field lines pointing all the way down here and all the way up here. So they're gonna to link together to mean that you have this really strong magnetic field in the center of the solenoid, all pointing in the same direction in the center and all pointing in the same direction on the outside. Now actually that should look like something that we had right at the very start, which is the same shape of field as a bar magnet. So there we are, that is the shape of field as a solenoid, and that is the same shape as a bar magnet field. And in fact, you can even say that this end is a north pole and this end is a south pole, because remember field lines point from north to south, and you can also talk about the field being strongest here in the center where the lines are closest together, or at, if you like, the poles of this solenoid. And also, if you then take that same solenoid and you reverse the current direction, then you will get a different dire uh, direction of field. So in this case, we have north down at the bottom and the south at the top on the left. And on the right, we have north at the top and the south on the left. And hopefully you can just see that all that's happened is we run the current the opposite way around in the solenoid. Okay, so that's that bit. The next bit is talking about Fleming's left hand rule. And that's a really tricky bit when you're doing magnetism at first, but actually it's pretty straightforward. Now remember one difficulty with this is now we're gonna talk about three dimensional space. We're gonna talk about um, X, Y, and the Z dimension. So when we're describing that, we stick to up or down, and up or down means up or down the page, okay? So up is this way, down is this way. Okay, and literally on the page, on the flat exam paper in front of you, up and down means that way, that way, right? Left and right is the easy one because you can't get confused with that. I would hope. <laughs> but then you also have into the page and out of the page. So when you're describing the direction of these things, just try and stick to those as your descriptors of the three dimensions. Up and down means up and down the page, left and right, left and right of the page, in and out of the page. Now, what you have to use is your left hand this time. The right, first one was the right hand, this time it's your left hand. And you have to use the left hand to predict the direction of these forces is the, the, the main thing. Now we're gonna talk about this first one at the top here that we're gonna talk about the um, diagram here that I've just put a number one next to. And we're gonna predict, well, it already is on there, but we're just gonna imagine that we have to work out the direction of the force. Now you use your left hand here and you get your thumb, your first finger and your second field, second finger all orientated at right angles to each other. Your thumb represents the direction of the force. Your first finger represents the direction of the field and your second finger represents the direction of the current. So I have a field going from north to south, so I'm gonna orientate this first finger in the direction of the field. And I have a current, which is going into the page. 
Okay, so rotate, leaving the field the same way, rotate my hand so that the um, current finger, the second finger, is pointing down into the page. And you can see hopefully the thumb is pointing uh, down the page. So the current into the page, the force is down, down the page. So that is the direction of the force here on that current carrying wire. Now we're going to talk about motors in a little while as well, but all the motor is really is a coil of wire in that field. So it simultaneously has the uh, current going into the page on the left and current coming out of the page on the right hand side. So if I just take my left hand again, I've still got the field this way, but the current this time is coming up out of the page. So rotate the thing means that the field's still that way, the current now out of the page, force is now upwards on that side. So because of that, because you've got two forces in opposite direction, you can cause a rotation. Now if you were asked to explain this, one common way to explain why this works is the idea of a catapult field. So if you can imagine having the permanent field here from north to south, so the black lines, and actually that's interacting, remember overlapping fields causes a force, interacting with the field around the current carrying wire. And there you can see, I hope, I hope that in the same direction on top, opposite direction underneath. And so you're actually getting this stronger magnetic field above and a weaker field below. And that's causing this repulsion, that's causing this, this force downwards, okay, there's an overall force downwards. Just do a few more then, because this is the type of one that you might have to figure out in the exam. Again, north to south, we'll do A first, this time current up the page. Just check that when you rotate it, you haven't changed the first one. So the field's left to right, north to south, current is up the page, okay, so the force is into the page. The second one, B, field still from left to right. Current is now down the page, so the force is up out of the page. We've just done these two, okay, but really quickly then, C, field's there, current's in, force is down. And then the last one, field's still left to right. Um, current is up out of the page, so force is up. Now actually, there are some factors that um, go into the size of that force. And essentially, higher the magnetic flux, the higher, sorry, the higher the magnetic flux density, I should say, which means the stronger the magnet, essentially. And don't say bigger magnet, by the way, say stronger magnet, if you're ever asked to describe that. Um, the higher magnetic flux density, the higher the force is gonna be. The higher the current, the higher the force is gonna be. And the longer the length of uh, wire in the field, the higher the force is gonna be as well. Now actually, those things are actually proportional to the force. Now those factors are actually proportional to the force. So we can actually get these little sketch graphs here. And I wanna talk a little bit about using the term direct proportionality correctly in your physics papers, okay? So if we vary the first one, magnetic flux density, that's B, and measure the force, then we'll get a straight line through the origin. It means double the flux density, double the force. Similarly, if we vary the current, then we will get a straight line through the origin. Double the current, double the force. And lastly, if we vary the length of wire in the field, if we double the length of wire, we will get double the force. So all three of those things are directly proportional to the force. And that's something we can use to describe these relationships, okay? Double the, what the X, double the Y, direct proportionality. And don't just take my word for it, here's some evidence for that. Well, this is actually a piece of wire here, which is actually in a magnetic field, okay? That's the magnetic field across here, okay? Magnets on either side of this kind of yoke thing here. And we're measuring the current, and we're also measuring here the force by seeing how much it presses down, presses down on this balance, okay? So increase the current, increase the force. And actually, if we do uh, plot these data, we do get that straight line graph. So hopefully you can see larger current here, larger force on the mass balance there, okay? And yes, it does come out to be proportional. So describe the relationship between force and current. You will get both of these marks if you simply state they are directly proportional. Now these, that this would have to be in response to being given maybe a graph like this, where you've actually got current varied and you've measured force, okay? And you've got a straight line through the origin graph like that. And they're gonna ask you to describe that relationship, force and current, force on the y-axis, current on the x. And 
to get both marks, if you notice that it's a straight line through the origin, you will get both marks by directly proportional. Many of you might write as current increases force increases which is not wrong but it's only worth one of the available marks okay now here's where the check step really comes in here because if you are good at checking your answer and looking back and saying right okay that's worth two marks and I've written as current increases force increases if you think to yourself well hmm I've, I've haven't got haven't said two clear statements, so I'm not going to get two marks. Well, hopefully you'll remember directly proportional is in fact worth the two marks. So stick with that. Be careful though, because some things aren't directly proportional. If the data was like this, then that's not directly proportional because it's not a straight line through the origin. And the other one to remember would be inverse proportionality, which means double one thing, half the other. But in this case, force is proportional to current. You can also get that from the equation F equals B I L. And that's a good example of where actually equations are useful for describing things. And you can, you can use equations like this one here, force is magnetic flux density or magnetic field strength times current times length. And you can use that to actually do some explanations because you could, from that you can see that double the length, double the force, as long as the other two things are the same. Let's rock on them, let's carry on this. Um, and that's that equation there. I didn't need to skip all the way back to that one, did I? Okay, there's an example of a calculation, but we're not doing um, that at this point. So here's an example question. Increasing the size of the current will increase the size of the force um, on a conductor in a magnetic field and give two other ways. Now, they often do this. Give is the thing there. This is not a tricky one. We just need to think two other ways. And this is where you're thinking of this equation. And you're going to think to yourself, well, I've got... Uh, three factors here that affect the size of the force. They've told me, this is just planning and really think about it. They've told me about the size of the current. I need to give it to two other ways. So two other ways of increasing the force would be increasing magnetic flux density or magnetic field strength. Okay, or increasing the length of the wire in the field or the conductor in the field. So hopefully you can see that equation is not just, it's not just as um, simple as doing calculations. Actually, there are other reasons behind that. There are other things you can do with that. You can actually use that for explaining questions as well. Okay, cool. So we're on to electric motors now, and I've done a quick sketch here. Now I just want to talk about the parts of the motor. Hopefully you can see that you, you've got a, a permanent magnet there, a permanent magnetic field between the north and the south poles. Okay, I'm going to delete that. Um, you can also see that you've got this loop of wire, and it's often a coil. It's not often not one loop. It's round and round and round and round and round. Because by the way, uh, looping round and round basically increases the length of the conductor in the field. Um, and you've got this thing here called the split ring commutator. I'm going to label that up and leave it there. Split ring commutator okay now that's basically a set of rings that are split okay and they are attached to the coil and as that rotates that that um, changes connection with these little gizmos next to it the brushes these little things here okay those brushes brush up on one side of the ring which is connected to one side of the coil uh, and then they, they brush up and connect with the other side of the ring. So what happens as that coil, as that motor rotates, is the the circuit, this driving circuit, this DC electric circuit, DC. Okay, motors run on DC, connects with one side and then the other. So it connects with yellow side, then green side, 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 then green side as it goes around. And that means that always on the left hand side of the motor, there will always be a force, let's say upwards. And on the right hand side, there will always be a force, let's say downwards. Now, actually, if we look, um, I will do it the same way around as my little two dimensional drawing, which you came across earlier on, where I actually had a wire going with a current going into the page on the left hand side and out of the page on the right hand side. Let's add the, that direction of current then. 
do that in red on my coil here. So I have the direction of current on the left hand side is into the page and on the right hand side is out of the page. So let's apply our right our left hand rule. Here it is. Okay, um, field goes across the page, current on the left is going into the page. So the force is downwards on the left hand side of the coil. And the current is the opposite direction. I can go through that again if you like. And the current is coming out of the page, so the force is upwards on the right hand side. Now, regardless of which color it is, always the current is going to be out of the page on the right hand side, into the page on the left hand side. So you're always going to get rotation in the same direction. Okay? That is the job of the split ring commutator, which essentially is just to change the direction of the current in the coil every half turn. So if you're asked to describe the role of a split ring commutator in an electric motor, that is to change the direction of the current every half turn of the coil. You can go into a little bit more detail if you like, but I think that's good enough really. Essentially, it's a moving connector which can uh, keep the current in the same direction on the left-hand side and a different direction, the opposite direction on the right-hand side, but always the same direction throughout. So the, even though the, correct, the direction of current on the yellow side changes, the left side of the motor is always the same. Now actually, we're going to talk about um, using electromagnetic indu induction and using one of those as a dynamo a little bit later on. I just want to talk about the national grid here. It's only in higher tier. It's only in the triple physics, um, but it's a really important application of electromagnetism because it uses transformers. Now this bit did come up briefly in paper one as well. So the way that we, we get high efficiency in our transmission wires is that we run them at very high voltages, very high PDs and very low currents. And we can explain that by talking about our use of step up and step down transformers and what they do to the voltages. Because what transformers do is they transform voltages. I'll come back to that. Okay. Um, so step up transformers, what they do is they increase the potential difference in the national grid. That because they increase the potential difference, they also reduce the current. And that's due to this equation here, okay, which says the power in if you like the power on the primary and electrical power is v times i is equal to the power out the power on the secondary and because power is v times i power on the primary is vpip power on the secondary is vsis you get this little equation here vpip is vsis now again you can do calculations with that but in explain questions you can use that to talk about what happens if you increase the the voltage, what happens to the current? If you double the PD, well, you have to half the current. So if this is two times this, then this number, IS, has to be half of this, okay? So what that means is that the product of both on either side is always the same. So you, you basically, you're reducing the current. The aim is reduce the current in the power lines. Why is reducing the current in the power lines the most important thing? That's because power loss is I squared R. So if you actually half the current, you get a quarter of the power loss. That makes the whole thing far more efficient. So when we're talking about why this is more efficient, you don't need to talk about resistance, that's a fixed thing. But we talk about reducing the current because in any case, current is the thing which causes heating. So current causes heating, less current, less heating effect, less power loss. That makes the whole system far more efficient. Then we have to step the PD back down again. So we have a lower PD for the consumers and a higher current to run the higher power devices. So here's an example question. Transformers are used in the national grid to increase the efficiency of electricity uh, transmission. So we don't have to talk about the step down bit in this question. Okay, that's the, that's the first clue, decoding it. Okay, we're only asked to explain how the efficiency is increased. So what is the uh, increase in efficiency? So step up transformers are used firstly. They increase the PD. Okay, 
which reduces the current. So I'm going to actually leave that as one marking point. Okay, um, and this means less power loss or re reference to I squared R power. And finally, um, therefore, the wires don't get as hot. There's less energy transfer to thermal in the surroundings, less energy to heating the surroundings. You could have it here, less waste energy or less energy dissipated would be a good one for that last marking point. Okay, I hope that makes sense. This is the uh, the type of thing here. Okay. Um, now, actually, this looks very, very similar to the motor, but it's a slightly different situation because here we're not talking about um, trying to uh, use a current to make a force. We're talking about causing something to spin. This is a generator. We're going to... I've really been bad with the PowerPoint today. <laughs> we're going to cause it to spin. Okay, we're going to cause that wire spin. We're going to attach it to something that's going to drive a turbine, drive a generator. Um, that is going to induce a potential difference. Now, when a conductor moves through a magnetic field, and it has to be moving, has to be a changing magnetic field. When a conductor moves through a magnetic field, you induce a current or induce a potential difference in it. Now, this is one slight different because instead of having a split ring commutator, we have this apparatus here. And this is what we call slip rings. And brushes. Now I think they've done that on purpose. That that sounds very similar to split ring commutator, right? But slip rings and brushes, notice they're complete rings. So the yellow side has a permanent connection to the blue slip ring. Okay, and the green side has a permanent connection to the purple slip ring in this diagram. And what that means is that as the yellow side goes up through the field, it's going to generate um, positive, let's say, potential difference. As the yellow side comes down through the other side, it's going to generate negative. Okay, it's going to have an in a negative induction. So what you're going to end up with is always the... Um, the yellow side connected to the blue slip ring, and so that blue slip ring is gonna go positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. So what you're going to generate is not DC, but is AC, alternating current or alternating potential difference. Now this, we commonly refer to this as a dynamo, okay, sorry, not a dynamo, pardon me, as an alternator. This is an alternator which produces AC. And if we use a motor backwards, see on this left-hand side, we would refer to that as a dynamo. Okay. So the alternator has the slip rings and brushes and a dynamo, which is a motor backwards, has um, a split ring commutator. And this is the two graphs that you get. So you get the alternating PD, alternating current PD here, AC PD with, um, the PD changing direction from positive to negative continuously because it has those permanent connections. Uh, whereas the dynamo gives us positive, 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 positive. Because as it spins, we have that split ring commutator, which is constantly changing the connection to either side of the, um, of the coil. So we're always getting with the purple connector here, we're always getting a piece of wire moving up through the field, so we're always getting positive on that side, for example. Okay, And this just summarizes that really. Okay, So uh, when a conductor moves through a magnetic field, a PD is induced in the conductor. There are two types, alternators and dyna dynamos. Alternators make AC, dynamos DC. There's the sketches of the graph. And alternators have slip rings, Okay, a permanent connection to each side of the output circuit. And dynamos have split ring commutators, which is a changing connector every half turn. Okay, uh, so really quickly then, this is the type of question they do ask, they really ask this one quite a lot. Just explain the difference between AC and DC. Okay, so this is an explain question because you have to actually uh, say what it is, say why it is, right? Explain the difference between AC, potential difference, and DC. Remember, this is the AC, positive, negative, positive, negative. So the important thing to, to write is AC changes direction 
from positive to negative. You can say DC never changes direction or DC, easiest way to say is DC is always positive current. And that's an important point to make because yes, it is changing the DC in the in the dynamo, but it's always positive. So it never changes direction. Really quickly, this is microphones and loudspeakers, and this is my way to get full marks on these questions. If they ask you to explain how a loudspeaker works, you go this way through the diagram. If they ask you to explain how a microphone works, you go this way through the diagram. This is all they can really ask for this. Um, in a loudspeaker, you have an AC signal, that's the kind of uh, digital sound wave or, or analog sound wave. That causes a coil of wire to move in a magnetic field. And that causes a sound wave. So loudspeakers have these uh, cones which push the air backwards and forwards. But it's all about that AC signal, alternating current, push and pull, push and pull, um, changing direction of the force, if you like, uh, to move a coil of wire in a magnetic field, and that causes a sound wave. If you have a microphone, then you have a sound wave causing a magnetic field to, uh, sorry, a coil of wire to move in a magnetic field, which causes an AC signal, a changing direction signal. So a question like this, explain how a microphone changes sound wave into an um, alternating electrical signal. All you need to say is that the sound wave causes a coil of wire to move in a magnetic field which causes an AC signal. Now that AC signal will have the same frequency and it will have a higher amplitude. If you're louder, have the same frequency of the sound uh, wave that created it. But you don't need to, need to if it's this one mark. We're just looking for the idea that you know there's a coil of wire moving in a magnetic field. Transformers then, um, there's two types of them. This one is a step down on the left. And this is a step up. And again, you can see hopefully that this equation allows us to explain how these work. So the equations are featuring here when I'm talking about describe and explain questions. And this equation, all this really says is that the ratio of the voltages is equal to the ratio of the turns. So if this side has more turns on the primary, so NP, more turns than NS, yeah, if that's NP is greater than NS, then VP is also gonna be greater than VS. So it's a step down, it's reduced the potential difference. Similarly, but different, if NP is less than NS, then VP is going to be less than VS. Um, so this is a step up, so VS is greater than VP. And actually, you can work that out with the, with the ratios, but this is just about using that equation to describe. Now, there's also a use of transformers, which is also to isolate currents, and that's why they have them in shaver sockets. Cool. So how they work. If they ask you how they work, it's memorize three marks. It's all going to be, explain how a transformer works, three marks. There's an alternating current in the primary coil. It has to be an alternating current. It cannot work with DC transformers, okay? And that causes a changing magnetic field in the coil, in the core, sorry. So you have this alternating current backwards and forwards in the primary core, uh, coil, and that causes a changing direction of magnetic field. So north, south, and it changes south, north, yeah? Like the solenoids we had right at the start. Um, and you have an AC, uh, and that generates an AC potential difference in the secondary coil. That is, if they ask you how a transformer works at any point, that will be the three marks that you will uh, have to write down there. It's really important you get alternating, changing, and alternating there. So let that sink in. I keep going with a bit of tea. All right. Um, now, how does a step up transformer? They have a larger number of turns on the secondary than the primary and they transform lower PD to higher PD. But just to say, don't get confused, if they ask you how a transformer works, it's this explanation. If they ask you about how you make a step up or a step down, it would be this explanation. So explain how a transformer works then. Well, what's the key things we need to do? Just 
asked to explain, we'll just think, bring up that, that idea. There is a alternating current in the primary coil that causes a changing magnetic field which induces an alternating PD. You can incidentally say alternating current at GCC, but it really should be an alternating PD on the secondary coil. Now just to say, if you got partly right, if you didn't put alternating on the first one, you said current, if you didn't put changing on the second one, and you didn't put um, which I haven't, induces an alternating PD on the secondary, then you wouldn't get those marks. You actually get zero without those three words. So again, this is this checking step here. Really think to yourself, oh, I remember that explanation of how a transformer works, but I have to get in alternating. I have to get in changing, and I have to get in alternating. It does not work. A transformer does not work if you do not use alternating uh, current in the primary. Um, it will not work if it isn't a changing magnetic field in the core. Okay, and uh, you won't get a, you won't induce a PD if it isn't an alternating PD. So that's all the magnetism stuff. Um, thanks again to Tassimai for sponsoring this revision live stream. Tassimai is the scientific way to learn, and I'm a head of science, and that really appeals to me. So check out the links in the description or the pinned comment to find out more. And what's more about Tassimai is you actually um, get it displayed as this tree, your kind of tree of knowledge. And your tree grows as you use Tassimai, and it gets green, greener and leafier. And the red ones are leaves that you keep getting wrong, and the yellow ones are ones you sometimes get wrong, and the green ones are ones you're kind of perfect on. So it allows you to kind of see all the learning objectives and what you're good at and what you're not so good at. And I, my students and I really like this uh, because you can go into the fine detail. So we know that if you do your daily goals, then you won't have any gaps in uh, your key knowledge for those exams. And they have courses in the major exam boards for GCC Sciences, English Literature and Maths. And we know if you do daily goals, then it will really benefit you. You'll have no, you'll remember everything you need for those exams. So find the link in the description or go to tasmai.com to find out more. Right, I'm going to do the space stopping now, and then there will be time for Q&A. Well done, you guys, for um, sticking around for this. Okay, so first of all, in the solar system, our solar system consists of uh, comets, dwarf planets, moons, eight planets, and the sun, and that's in ascending size or, uh, order. Now you could really have, I guess, dwarf planets, or you could have a dwarf planet bigger than a moon and a moon bigger than a dwarf planet, so those two could be inter kind of interchangeable. Uh, our sun and its solar system is part of a galaxy called uh, the Milky Way. Now, importantly, our sun is in the, its main sequence. It would have started as a cloud of gas and dust, which we call a nebula, and it was drawn together by gravity. And then there would have been the friction between those particles, and nuclear fusion would have started. And that's called a, a protostar when that happens. And then, eventually, there would be enough material doing fusion that you have this balance between the outwards force due to the fusion and the inwards force of gravity. Now you need to um, describe in detail every single step in a star's life, okay? And you need to explain the process in between them. But really quickly, objects in our solar system, it could be as simple as this, just uh, complete this list uh, from smallest to largest, comets, dwarf planets, moons, planets, and the sun. So they do like us to just have that kind of list of information of objects in our solar system and get their sizes right. Now these are definitions of those different parts, okay? I'm not going to read all those out, but you can pause that. But after a main sequence, then the sun will become a red giant and it will expand and it will cool. And in that process, it's going to fuse together all the elements up to and including iron. And what will happen at the end of that red giant phase is the outermost layers will just drift down into space and you're left behind this white dwarf and a planetary nebula. Now we think that the next thing on the, on the list will be a black dwarf and fusion will eventually stop, so it will eventually stop running, uh, giving out light. Um, this is the life cycle of stars with a similar mass to our sun. And what you need to be careful about when you're doing the questions is that they're going to normally ask, not for the whole thing, not for the whole sequence, they're going to normally ask about a specific star, size of star and they're going to ask for a specific 
part of the sequence. They also may just ask you for the names of the stages, or they might ask you for the details of how one stage gets to another. So you need to read really carefully and think about it. So here's a kind of whole diagram, and this is my way to sort of memorize it. So all stars start in that same way, a nebula contracting due to, due to gravity, fusion, protostar, then when you get the balance of the force in and the force out, the gravity in, the radiation pressure out, you get a main sequence star. Now a star with a similar mass or a lower mass star like our sun is going to go down this left hand side. It's going to expand and cool down to become a red giant and then it's going to, the layers are going to drift down to space and you get this white dwarf with this planetary nebula around it. And finally it will become a black dwarf but A we can't take a photo of them because they don't give any light and B um, the, the universe isn't even old enough for these things to happen Okay, the, yet. Okay. Now a star which has got larger mass than a sun will still expand and cool, but it'll be much bigger, much bigger mass, and it will be called therefore a red supergiant. And eventually the layers won't just drift out into space because of the higher gravity of the red supergiant, it's going to, the layers are gonna collapse in on this dense iron core. And when they collapse in, then there's two options. It could either become a neutron star, which is an incredibly dense pool of neutrons, or a black hole. And we don't know what a black hole is, but we know it's an object so dense that it, uh, not even light can escape it. So let's have a crack at that. So we've got to really memorize that diagram and the ways, the processes between them. Have a look at this question here. So this question is a six marker. So we've got to decode this one together. And this is the most important skill. Decoding six markers is hugely important, right? Uh, a main sequence star is a ball of hydrogen undergoing nuclear fusion. So they've told us a little bit about main sequence. Describe in detail the sequence of events that led to the formation of a main sequence star. Six marks. So I've got to describe it. I don't have to say why it is or anything like that, but I just have to say what the steps are and the, the correct sequence of events. So I need to um, get in here, not just uh, the names of it, but I've got to give the details as well. So actually, and when I'm planning, I could think to myself, right, I'm just going to write a list of the things in my little plan, and then I'm going to build them out into paragraphs. So it starts with a nebula. They haven't told me that, so. Uh, then you get a protostar. And then you end up with a main sequence star. Right? That's our final bit. Now, if you just write those names down, you're probably limiting yourself to like two marks. If you just get one of them, or they're not in the right order or something like that, then maybe you're only gonna get one. But the actual um, details of how they've moved from one to the other, the sequence of events, that's gonna get you the higher marks, isn't it? So what happens to the nebula that turns it into a protostar? Well, this is a, uh, and what is it as well, exactly what is it? It's a cloud of gas and dust. So that's the next step, I guess, to say what they all are. Okay, what is a protostar? It's a point in the nebula where fusion has started, so hydrogen fusion has started. Now, the main sequence star, what is that? It's a ball, I've told you, it's a ball of hydrogen and undergoing fusion. But what is the kind of stop point? What is the point where it becomes that main sequence star? This is when you get the balance of um, outwards radiation pressure, and inwards gravity. And this is why we have um, spherical ball-shaped stars. Now, again, let's have a little think how much we've done so far. We haven't really talked about how they've moved between those. So, so far, we're only really going to have, we're only really currently having the stages, their names, and a description of them. So how did it go from one stage to the next? Well, okay, the nebula, it contracted, and that's gonna get us into the five and six marks, yeah? Contracted, contracts due to gravity. Okay, you're gonna get friction between the particles. Yeah. That's going to cause the high temperature and pressure necessary for hydrogen fusion. Okay, and that's that's that. 
Um, that's going to get us all six marks pretty much there because we just to check back three. We've got the names, we've got the description of what they are, and we have the links between them, the, the, the processes between them. Now this is just the last little bits, okay? If it's got a higher mass, then then you're going to have a red supergiant star, and they actually kind of pulsate, they they uh, expand and contract, and they kind of heat up and cool down, and more and more fusion happens. You get layers of all heavier and heavier elements closer to the core, and actually what happens is the the because it's got so much gravity, the layers um, collapse in on that core, and they bounce off the core, and that's when the explosion occurs. Okay, so that's a red supergiant. This is the description I've just given you of a supernova. And what's left over could be a neutron star or it could be a black hole. Okay. Um, now this again is another example question. Again, it's a describe, let's decode it. The stages and processes involved in changing a main sequence star into a black hole. So this is worth four. So what are the stages? Okay, the stages are red supergiant. Now we don't need to mention main sequence because it's in there. They've told us that in the question. Red supergiant and um, supernova. Okay, what's the difference between a red supergiant? Or well, how does a main sequence star get to a red supergiant? It expands and cools. What is a supernova? What's that process? Yep, um, layers collapsing themselves. You could talk about gravitational collapse, yeah. And they bounce off a um, a dense iron core in an explosion, and often, sometimes you get that mark just for explosion, which is a real nuisance. But anyway, um, have we done everything? We've answered it. Check. Have we just got the processes? and the stages. We've got red supergiant, we've got supernova. We've got the processes, expands and cools into a red, red supergiant. The process, the layers collapse into, um, due to gravity, bounce off their core, that's an explosion, that's the process of a supernova. You don't have to talk about what could happen next, we don't have to mention neutron star, um, okay? Because we just have to say supernova occurs and the next step is gonna be a black hole. Talking about orbital motion quickly and the different types of satellites that there are. Um, we can have a satellite with a higher force because it's closer to Earth and therefore it's got a higher speed or higher up in a geostationary orbit. That is going to be a um, that is going to be a lower force and a lower speed because it's higher up in its orbit. Now the useful analogy is Newton's cannon and that's a really good way to explain this. If uh, I went up onto a high mountain, a high enough mountain, yeah, it would need to be high so that it, such that it was in space. Newton kind of said this as his way of explaining how orbit would work. If you were to fire a cannonball at just the right speed and that speed two, it would go once around earth and it would hit you in the back of the head. Okay, and that's pathway two there. Um, if it was going too slow, then it would actually do path one. It would uh, fall down to earth. If it was going too fast, it would do path three and it would spiral away from Earth, right? So Newton's point was that Earth is curved and if you fire it at the right speed, then as the object falls down to Earth, then Earth curves down away from it at the same rate. And so it's going to stay the same height above Earth and it's going to do one complete loop. And he was absolutely right about that. So there's a useful analogy there. Um, but one question they love to slip in about this one is to ask you to explain why an object moving at a constant speed in a circular orbit, sorry, that should be, can be said to be accelerating, okay? Well, this is actually a question about scalars and vectors. What is moving at constant speed, but something is changing, okay? Its direction is changing. That's the first mark to recognize it's moving at constant speed, but its direction is changing and forces they cause a change in speed or direction. And um, well, if the direction is changing, then velocity is changing because velocity is a vector. So therefore it's accelerating. So basically acceleration is a rate of change of velocity. It is also 
a vector. Okay. And then redshift is the last little um, unit of this and uh, Hubble's law afterwards. Um, redshift is just an apparent change in wavelengths because an object is moving away from you. So actually when we look at distant galaxies we see that their light is redshifted which means they're essentially we are observer B, we're over here looking at an object which is moving away from us this direction and the light that it emits okay, appears to be stretched, it appears to have a longer wavelength and so that is shifted towards the red end of the spectrum so we call it redshift and Hubble actually analyzed the spectra of light from distant galaxies and noticed that pretty much they were all redshifted, they were all moving away from us and it's analyzing these emission spectra and absorption spectra to see the same pattern but shifted towards the higher wavelength, okay, towards the red end of the spectrum and we call this redshift okay, this is a stationary source and this is a receding source, it means moving further away Okay, so, so like moving away from us, not just far away from us, but also moving away from us. So really quickly, what is it meant by redshift? Explain that. Um, that is the observed increase in wavelength. Of light from a distant galaxy. Um, why is that? It's asked us to explain because it's moving away from us. Okay, that's what redshift is increasing wavelength. Red end is the um, radio wave end, it's the long wave end of the uh, spectrum. And Hubble noticed that actually the further away a galaxy was, distance of the galaxy from Earth, the more redshifted the light was. So the faster it was moving away from Earth. So Hubble's law just states that the distance is proportional to the speed away from us. And that is good evidence for the Big Bang Theory, which is the idea that the universe started from this hot, dense point and has been expanding ever since. Now, there's one more thing you need to know about our understanding of the universe currently, uh, which is that from 1998 onwards, there actually was measurements of supernova, which have actually it suggested that the rate of expansion of our universe is increasing. And one possible explanation of this is dark matter and dark energy. And we don't know much about them yet. So you just need to kind of be aware of it because they could ask you that kind of one liner question. Um, what do scientists think is causing the acceleration in the universe? And that could be dark matter or dark energy. We don't know anything about it because it's dark. <laughs> Sounds silly to say that, but it doesn't seem to interact with light. So all of our telescopes, they just analyze the electromagnetic spectrum. So if there's something out there that doesn't interact with light or give out any light, then we can't really analyze it currently. We can't go and see and test it because it's, you know, we're talking about um, dark matter in distant galaxies here. And really quickly as well, scientists use um, models to explain evidence, right? Uh, Hubble's model really nicely, um, sorry, Hub the Big Bang Theory is the model that really nicely explains Hubble's data. Now there are other bits of data that make that more uh, convincing, such as the CMBR, the Cosmic Microwave Background Radiation. And it isn't mentioned by name, but it's well worth knowing this, because we have two really strong bits of evidence that point to the same theory. And when you have two um, strong bits of evidence that point to the same theory, then that is a strong theory. Um, explain how Hubble's data, uh, which is shown in the figure below, supports the idea the universe began from a small, hot, dense point. Okay, so this would probably be um, two marks. Okay, what does the data show? It shows that the further away the galaxy is, the faster it is moving, yeah? So the further away a galaxy is, the faster it's moving away. You could also say the directly proportional. And why does that support the idea that the universe started from a small hot dense point? Well, if everything is moving away from everything else, then the universe is expanding. This means the universe is expanding. So it stands to reason it started small. Okay, so that is all the content for today. That's all the um, explained questions. There'll be a Q&A in a moment. So if you've got any questions for me at all, then go ahead and ping them onto the chat. I've pretty much done an hour. So um, I hope that was what I expected to do. That's good. I'm glad it fitted in the right amount of time. 
Um, thanks very much to Tassimai for sponsoring this live feed. Um, it's a really excellent app. I really like using it. It's, uh, it uses AI to target the areas you need to develop in order to make sure you master the content for your GCSEs. And Tassimai gets to know you and make sure you keep practicing on your priority areas until you can't get it wrong. I use Tassimai in my school to make sure the students have memorized the key content for their exams. Um, we know if they just complete 10 minutes of Tassimai every day, then they're or even just four days a week, they're going to get all the recall questions right in their exam. And that's great. Now, you might be able to get Tassimai through your school, and that's by far the cheapest way to get it. But if not, you can always set up a um, private subscription on the website. And there's also a free trial. I strongly suggest you try the free trial of Tassimai if you don't get it through your school, um, because you might as well try it now for the mock exam. And if you like it, then buy it for the real thing. Okay. Um, now, just to say to you, is there any questions at all um, in the chat? I do have the other live streams to remind you about um, in series one, which went through paper one content um, and have a little look back on my channel for those. I went through the similar ideas. I talked about how to revise and I did practical questions. I did calculation questions and written questions for paper one stuff. And then also I've done paper two um, in January and February. Same idea. I did how to prepare for it and practical questions, calculation questions, and then written questions. So lots of really useful content there. Make sure you go ahead and check it out. Having a look for uh, through the chat. Oh, best physics book for beginners. That's an interesting question. Physics for you is probably the best all round physics book that there is. If you just want to buy one, there's a GCSE version and there is an A level version strongly recommend physics for you there's loads of good books out there um i think it's important to have a, a course textbook and then also so one that is linked to your course so one that is endorsed by aqa to cover all the material accurately for example if you do an aqa physics so definitely get that and then if not if um you know if you also want a good beginner level uh, textbook that's going to cover everything that you need for any course then physics for you is probably a good shout shout there um, any others at all? Thank you for the stream. Yeah, glad glad to see you again, my buddy. Yeah, um, very nice. Oh, this is a nice comment. You really helped me in an A level test I had. Thank you very much. So, what um, if you're still knocking about? Then what? Which test was that? And I'm glad to help. I like your bookshelf. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, um, it's always a bit messy. You can probably just about see some cameras and lenses on there because you know uh, when you learn to do YouTube, you start getting involved and interested in cameras. Um, <laughs> Also, uh, lots of books. That one tends to be like travel books and um, like trash fiction, but the good stuff's upstairs. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's like having uh, live streams showing off your bookshelves in the background. Um, right, good to see you all. Lots of people saying hello from India, which is very, very nice to see. I know that loads of people use YouTube for international um, GCSEs and A-levels as well. I just have one more time to say thanks for, to Tasmai for sponsoring this live stream. It's a quizzing app and it's based on evidence. And that's the best thing about it. It really helps our students get the top grades, which is what we're all about here at Gorilla Physics, aiming to get you the top grade. Check out the links in the description or the pinned comment, or just go to tasmai.com. And one of Tasmai's mantras, which I really like, is that practice makes permanent. But what's more, it gets to know what you do and don't remember. And we use Tasmai to make sure that students are focused on memorizing the key content for their exams. And we trust it because it's based on the evidence. Okay, now if you don't get Tasmai through your school, you can set up a private subscription on the website. There's also a seven day free trial. So go ahead and check that out. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Kibbert's Masters and we'll be back with more content closer to exams. We'll also talk about the advanced information that's been released due to this uh, crazy year or set of years that we've all had in education uh, and across the world. Um, so I'll be looking at detailed content about the stuff that they've now told us is going to be on those exams. So thank you so much for watching.